Uh, the story goes like this. The dim-witted Norwegian Lutherans, Ole and Lena, were having a fight one morning. And if you're not familiar with uh, Ole and Lena, they are a, a common ruse for Lutherans everywhere, Norwegian Lutherans. And they get up one morning, and Lena made the coffee and the breakfast, and she was, you know, frustrated with all, doing all the work. And she said, Ole, I think it's about time that you make the coffee around here. I made it every morning, and I'm tired of doing it. And Oli said, oh, no, no, Lena, that's, that's a woman's job now, you know, there, she's in charge of the household, and she's the main authority in the home, and it's a woman's job to make the coffee. And she said, no, no, Oli, you need to serve your wife and your family, it's the, the husband's job to make the coffee. And he said, no, it's, it's the woman's job, and she said, no, it's the man's job. And they said, ah, and they threw their hands at each other. A couple minutes later, Lena sits down in her easy chair, opens up her Bible. Apparently, they're reading through the Bible, too. And, and she said, oh, Oli, it says right here in the Bible, Hebrews. <laughs> For those of you in the back, it's Hebrews the coffee. See, it's Hebrews. Okay. okay. <laughs> So this letter of Paul's letter to the Hebrews, to the Jewish faithful people, comes at an interesting time in history, around year 70 AD, when uh, the temple, the Jerusalem temple, that the faithful Jews witnessed and did all their sacrifices in, it's the way they atoned or made themselves right before God, that temple was destroyed. And the, uh, the, the Jews uh, who had kind of bought in early adopters to Christ uh, coming out of this Jewish Messiah, coming out of the Jewish faith, they were having reservations. And they were kind of backsliding back to the, the ways that they knew, the old Jewish ways of following the law and trying to be good rule keepers. And Paul writes, not to us, but to these faithful Jews saying, listen, don't backslide. Don't backslide. God is doing something new in Jesus for us. He is our new promise, God's new covenant. Covenant is a fancy word that means spiritual promise. That's between God and God's people, and it's unbreakable because God does it. And just like God gave us the first promise or the first covenant, the first testament, the Old Testament, God is now giving us the new covenant, the new promise, the new testament. And, and this promise, uh, Paul says, is established on better promises. What does Paul mean by that? Better established on better promises. Well, Paul says that the Lord says, I will now put my laws on their, on their minds and write them in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Everyone will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their wickedness and know their sins no more. Why is it better promises? Well, I think maybe the method, for one, God is now writing this on our hearts. And God is writing this in our minds. It is with us. The first testament, the first promise was written on stone tablets, right? I give you now these 15, oh, he drops on 10 commandments, right? Anybody remember that from uh, Mel Gibson or Mel, uh, help me out, Mel Brooks, yeah. Go watch Mel Brooks now and you'll get the, get it, the reference. So God comes down, right, from, the, or excuse me, Moses comes down from uh, Mount Sinai, he speaks to God, and he brings these 10 uh, laws that they're supposed to, people are supposed to follow. That's God's first testament. And by the way, uh, did you know, speaking of Pastor Kay Slocum, she was in uh, the, ten, the movie The Ten Commandments. She, in her life before being a pastor, she was an actress in old Hollywood. And she played the lute in The Ten Commandments and was there, and it's a true story, in the, in the scene, Charlton Heston as Moses comes down the mountain. And a few years ago, Kay, Pastor Kay was leading an adult ed class on Genesis right here in the spot, packed room like this morning. Yeah. And she's talking about this when God meets the first promise and comes down off the mountain. She says, and you know, he smelled like Old Spice. So <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, you were there. <laughs> Charlton Heston apparently wore Old Spice. But... Uh, <laughs> So God makes this law that's outside of ourselves, and it's very hard to keep. And now with this new law, God writes it on our hearts. And it's in our minds. It's with you. It's mobile now. You're God's first mobile app, right? Where you go, God is with you. If you go to school or to work, you know, God, God is with you. God is, is in your heart, is in your mind, is, is with you. Martin Luther put it this way. Christ is closer to you than your own skin. 
Think about that for a second. Our living God, who created the whole universe and everything, is closer to you than your own skin. God is with us. There's a new movie coming out uh, featuring Mr. Rogers. Has anyone seen the trailer for this? Um, who, who wants to be my neighbor or something like that? And I'd encourage everyone to go see it. It comes out in November next month. And I was watching the trailer. stars Tom Hanks, the mayor of Hollywood. And it looks, it looks incredible. And, and in it, as the story goes, there's a reporter sent to interview Mr. Rogers from a major magazine, a story on heroes. And this reporter... Uh, has some brokenness in his life. He's having some trouble, I think, with his marriage. And, and I don't want to say he's having a crisis of faith, but he's having a crisis. And he comes and he's assigned by his magazine to go talk to Mr. Rogers. And for those of you who don't know, true story, Fred Rogers was a Presbyterian pastor before going into television. True story. So he's a Presbyterian pastor and he goes into television. I did the other thing. I was a, you know, on television and then when I became a pastor. We kind of crisscrossed there. And I think that Mr. Rogers never really took the collar off. And on his show, he would have kids of different abilities. And he'd bring them on and he'd say famously, don't let this you know, hold you back. You can do anything. You've got this. And the reporter comes to Fred Rogers and he says, knowing his own condition, he asks him, why do you love broken people so much? Why is it that you love broken people? And I think that Fred never really took that collar off. I think it's hidden behind that red cardigan <laughs> sweater he used to wear. And I think Fred, I'm speaking for him, I think Fred loves broken, loved broken people so much because he knows his God loved broken people so much. That in the scripture today it says God loved from the least of the greatest. We all know everybody loves the greatest, right? We heap accolades on the heroes and the winners in life. They've, they've got it made. But when you say that God does it for the least of these, the broken people, you and I, now you're on to something. Now this, this promise from God goes beyond a small sect of Jewish people and a small part of the world in the ancient Mediterranean to now people all over the globe. In every walk of life and skin color and and nationality and belief. You don't just have to be a Jew, but you could be a Christian or a Hindu or a, a non-believer or a skeptic. And God loves the whole world and loves all of them and believes in all of us and comes to this world for all of us in his only son, Jesus the Christ, and asks us to put our faith in him. This is being established on better promises. And again, later on, Paul says, that Jesus uh, didn't come to suffer many times, but only once for all. What does he mean by that? Well, for the Jewish audience, and again, that temple that was destroyed, the temple contained kind of a layer of holiness. The outside court was for anybody. We could have got in there. But to be the inside court, you had to be of the Jewish faith to get inside the temple. He had to pass their litmus test. And then to get even inside there in the altar area where they did the sacrifices, um, you would have to be even higher up and cleaner. The, the, the priests, the Levites of the Jewish faith, the, the pastors of, of the Jewish faith, they'd have to clean themselves religiously and relentlessly. And then they'd carve up a bunch of animals and it's just a whole bunch of gross stuff. And they did this on your behalf. The Jews would say, listen, I broke number three, six, nine, and, and ten this week. Would you go in and pray for me? And the Levites said, yep, three, six, nine, ten, got it. And they would clean themselves and they would go in and they would go in the whole, not even just the altar area, but they would go behind the curtain to the holiest of holy places where only the living God resided and only they could go. Yeah. And they prayed for you. Paul says that Jesus is like our high priest of the Jewish faith. He's the one that goes behind the curtain for us. But he doesn't have to go and suffer again and again and again and again and again because you keep screwing up again and again and again. That Our high priest suffers once and for all. For all people and for all time. All time. When Jesus stretched out his hands on the cross and he says, it is finished, and he was crucified and it went dark and there was rolling thunder and rumbling and the temple shook at that time, it said that the curtain that held the, the, the holiest of holies beyond the people was torn in two. 
violently torn, the Greek says, and opened up so that we may now enter in and be with God eternally and God may be with us right now and eternally. You know, there's one other interesting fun fact. There's one other place for that Greek word. It's only used twice in the entire Bible. Once, uh, when the curtain was, was torn, when Jesus was crucified and we enter in, the second time at our gospel reading today, when Jesus was baptized at the beginning of his public ministry, he goes out into the water and is baptized by John, and the scripture says that the heavens were violently torn open, and and God, through the Holy Spirit, descended upon Jesus, his only Son, and the Father. There's your Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One God and three persons right there. And the Father speaks and says, This is my Son, whom I love. And he's here for you. I have opened the way up. And he's here for you to love thy neighbor, to love the broken people, to not be discouraged in the face of all that you're facing. We face big challenges today, amen? We've got a lot of problems in America and throughout the world. There's divisiveness. There's racism. There's a, 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 a crisis in the church. God has seen it all, friends. Throughout the ages, this is, this is cakewalk for God. The time is to trust in God, who is closer to you than your own skin and calls you to be his light, his hands and feet. Pick up a paintbrush and paint for habitat. Go pick up some garbage in the neighborhood. And when you do those small things, when you bring the hope of Jesus Christ to a person who is out there in the darkness, you are being living lights of Christ. God is with you. God is with all of us. This is the new promise, the new covenant of God in Jesus Christ. Amen.